So one, one of the things that is really good about um, the probiotic that you are offering is that you there have been trials run on it. And there's very few like clinical trials that are actually run on uh, probiotics. So that that's really cool. So can you talk about what you have seen? Can you talk about the trials? I mean, how were they structured? What, what did you do? And what were the outcomes that you saw? Sure. Um, first of all, we when we launched into this, this is about a decade long endeavor. So I, I don't, I you, no one would ever call us an overnight success. <laughs> and so um, I would say when we first started, we we knew that there was good science underlying the potential role of the gut microbiome in metabolism. So this so called link between gut health and metabolic health. And we further observed, and other people around the world had all observed that people that have um, slower metabolism. So people with obesity, prediabetes, and type 2 diabetes were low or entirely missing certain strains. And we also observe that. And then when you double click into these strains and you say, well, if they're missing, like, why should that be a problem for metabolism? You realize there are these two big functions that are important. One is what you talked about, which is the production of butyrate, which we know can help stimulate GLP-1 and therefore insulin um, uh, response. And then the second was this acromancia, which uh, appeared to be really important for something fundamental to the gut, because if you were lower missing it, you appear to have a lot of different diseases associated with that. So we knew that people with metabolic syndrome were low or missing the ability to produce butyrate in their microbiome, and they were lower missing acromancia. And so our hypothesis was, okay, if we can give people back acromancia and these strains, which enable production of butyrate, um, can we see a uh, improvement in their metabolic syndrome? And so we, first of all, the first uh, wall we ran up against was that these strains were all strict anaerobes. Um, so the part of your gut microbiome or the part of your gut that we refer to when we talk about the microbiome is the distal colon. And it turns out there's no oxygen there. And so these strains are really different from the things that are on the shelves right now. So these lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains in that when you try to grow them, you cannot allow a single molecule of oxygen into that growth or the whole thing dies. So they're very sensitive and you essentially have to emulate what's happening in the distal colon in the lab in order to even grow the strains. So once we grew the strains, um, we performed preclinical studies uh, in which we showed that we were able to lower blood glucose spikes in those models. And then a kind of the um, one of the really important studies that we ran was a placebo-controlled, double-blinded, randomized trial. This was in people with type 2 diabetes, and we had three arms. So one arm was the placebo. One arm was the full formulation of all the strains that can produce butyrate. It's sort of a multi-step biochemical reaction, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So we had all the steps to that reaction and acromancia. And then we also ran a subset. So it was only three of those five strains where we said, okay, well, what if you don't have acromancia? And we took out another strain. What if you just had just the butyrate producing strains in there alone? you know, how does that do? Um, and we had people on the these three different, you know, either placebo or these two different formulations for 90 days. And then they did a four week washout period. And what we found was that compared to placebo, people who were on that full formulation of the five strains were able to see their A1C drop by 0.6 and their blood glucose spikes drop by 33%. And that is, um, for anybody who's battling prediabetes or diabetes, that can be the difference between having diabetes and being healthy. And so it was just a really exciting moment to realize that a gut microbiome intervention could in fact change our metabolic health. Um, and then we've continued to do studies from there, but that study was published in BMJ and that kind of really springboarded us into product creation. Interesting. How many, how many participants were there? Uh, there were 76 people in that study. So it was a, it was a, it was a first, you know, a first go mm. at it. Right. But also I was thinking like with, with a, that small number of people that the, uh, the ability to get a sig significant result was that must mean that the effect size was reasonably large. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was both statistically and as you know, clinically significant. And so right. it was really um, exciting to see that. I mean, we were a startup company. And so mm -hmm. you're constantly playing this game of what's the minimum amount I can spend? Or what's the minimum thing I have to do in order to see a signal? And we mm -hmm. just, I mean, to be totally honest with you, in a lot of ways, we've been lucky. And, and that was one of them, because I don't know that we could have afforded to do a larger study. <laughs> 
Right. But that is really interesting. So what they used uh, glucose control, right? It, it, essentially, it's it's what you have packaged as glucose control. So can you talk about that a bit? It, so it has Acomantia. What are the other components of that? So um, there are four other strains in there, and they are designed to help increase butyrate. And so um, there is Bifidobacterium infantis, Clostridium uh, butyricum, which we talked about, which is a butyrate mm -hmm. producer, uh, Clostridium bejerinki, which has some redundant function, and then Anaerobutyricum halai, uh, which was previously known as Eubacterium halai. Um, and it's also a pretty new strain that has been associated with type 2 diabetes in that people with diabetes are low or missing this strain. And it's believed to also play a role in short chain fatty acid production. So when you use these as a probiotic, do they remain in the gut? I, I mean, do you have to keep taking it or do they kind of take up residence? Oh, the million dollar question. And of course, <laughs> the answer is it depends. Okay. Um, when, we, when we did our trial, um, after people were on pills for 90 days, we were able to see that the strains were in their gut. But we did this four week washout. And after four weeks of not taking the strain anymore, most people lost the strains. But about 15% of them still had the strains colonized even after they hadn't taken a single pill for 30 days. And that's kind of the holy grail. What is it about those 30 people that uh, enabled them to really get this strain colonization? And we sort of hoped it was going to be as simple as, oh, their starting microbiomes look different. And so they were able to sustain these strains. I mean, you're trying to introduce strains into an existing ecosystem. So mm. it's like trying to plant a new flower in an already packed garden. It's pretty hard to do. And so we thought, well, if we knew what the garden looked like ahead of time, maybe it had certain holes or gaps in it that you would say, okay, that's why these things could take a foothold. It's not, unfortunately, as simple as that. We really couldn't see those kinds of patterns. And so it is possible that even though we asked these participants to not change anything about their lifestyles or diet, that they might have, because one of the ways in which you can enhance the uh, growth of these strains is through feeding them the food that they eat in the form of prebiotics. So if you were moving to a higher fiber diet or a high polyphenol diet, you could actually help these strains sustain and grow. And so the reality of it is that if you're lower missing these strains, it's highly likely that you could consume the strains and the prebiotics that feed the strains, and you could bolster the growth of them, and then maybe just go off of taking the strains and just continue on with these prebiotics um, as a way to sustain the strains. Um, but I'll say one more piece of information about that is that um, even though we know that diet and exercise and lifestyle and all those things um, play a really important role in shaping your gut microbiome, like some of the biggest things you can do to change your microbiome or to take an antibiotic or to go from being an, a carnivore to a vegetarian. So there are ways you can control you know, what happens in your gut. But there are things that uh, alter your gut that are really out of your control. So we know that your gut microbiome becomes less diverse as you age. We know your microbiome becomes less diverse as you go through periods of intense stress. We know that for women, our microbiomes become depleted when we go through menopause. We also know that even circadian rhythms, so when you travel and day becomes night and night becomes day, that can cause your microbiome to become depleted. So there's all these things which are just part of being a human being that can cause your microbiome to become depleted. So when you think about, you know, a, a repopulating your gut microbiome, there might be periods where you can kind of... Um, renew these strains, regenerate these strains, and then you might be able to go off of them. But it is possible that later you lose those strains again through no fault of your own. You're feeding them all the prebiotics they need, but just these other life occurrences. And so um, it is the million dollar question. Nobody really knows for each individual, how long do you have to be in the strains and how do you really get them to colonize in your gut? So generally anything to do with the mi microbiome, I believe like fiber helps, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't help Acomantia, but particularly, I mean, it does help Acomantia, but it helps everything else as well. W would that be correct? Or is it uh, specific to like good bacteria? Well, the phrase good bacteria is its own debate uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. in and of itself. <laughs> um, I think that um, it is clear that, you know, fibers and things like inulin are a good source of food for probiotics that are known to have beneficial effects. So for example, all of these butyrate producers and things that produce small molecules upstream of butyrate. Um, and so it, it is true, a high fiber diet, we all know we're supposed to be eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And one of the important things that it does, is it is feeding these beneficial microbes. 
And the only reason I say that it's sort of controversial whether something is a good or a bad microbe is that because it is an ecosystem, it has to do with the context in which that microbe exists, whether you, you might consider it good or bad. You know, one example is Clostridium difficile. Everybody thinks C. diff is so terrible. Well, most of us have C. diff in our in our systems. We have it in our gut at very low levels. Um, but in the context where there's no other competitors around, like you've taken an antibiotic, and all of a sudden this strain can start to propagate unchecked and gets to really high levels, that's when it can start to make you really sick and you know ultimately could be fatal. But in and of itself in the context of a microbiome ecosystem, many of us walk around with C. diff and we're perfectly fine. Hmm. Right. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> that I, I may have it. So you, one thing you mentioned was uh, polyphenols help. Uh, can you be any more specific? I mean, uh, polyphenols is a very wide range of things, right? It's from coffee to vegetables to wine. Um, so any specific polyphenols that are helpful? Um, well, we tested a, so there's multiple clinical kind of uh, studies that have shown that different polyphenols can increase acromancy levels in the gut and, and certainly have uh, um, beneficial kind of antioxidant uh, activities. We tested a wide variety of different polyphenols with our acromancia strain, and we found that three of them were really uh, worked well with acromancia. And so um, we actually created a polyphenol formulation based on that data. Um, and it was um, polyphenols from pomegranate extract, green tea, and um, grape seed. Mm. However, I mean, I love getting my polyphenols from red wine and chocolate. So <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, multiple ways to get polyphenols into the system.